How much vitamin D should we take? A blood test can usually decide that, but always talk to your doctor. Two doctors here today. Dr. Ross Pelton is a pharmacist. He's going to be talking about heartburn, acid reflux, stomach acid, etc. And he's going to talk about probiotics. Folks, sometimes we have this and you're a probiotic away from getting better. Then OBGYN, Dr. Margaret Christensen, a friend of mine, who really stopped her practice after she was exposed to mold and became very sick. She's gonna discuss what happened there. Prostate and the PSA, how reliable is that test? Why are we still using it in the numbers we are? All that and more on this Know the Cause. Today's Know the Cause is brought to you by Dr. O'Hara's Probiotics. Discover the Dr. O'Hara difference. For the past 45 years, I have dedicated my life and my whole career to finding the root cause of disease. And I now know with certainty that we must play a role in our own health care. I'm a self-care advocate, and you know what? Every time you change your diet for the better, exercise, or swallow a nutritional supplement, so are you. Now welcome to Know the Cause. My career has been such a blessing. Along the lines, I met Dr. A.V. Costantini, who wrote the book Prostate Cancer, Hope at Last. The whole book is on fungus. And I met the doctor who discovered the PSA, uh, the great prostate hoax he wrote, how uh, big medicine hijacked the PSA test and caused a public health disaster. Agree 150%. That's why I interviewed him on my show. And I'll quote these books. Uh, prostatitis, okay, I, I don't have a urologist. I've never been to a prostate doctor, and I'm an old guy. Prostate, it sounds sore. Prostatitis, ouch, I put. According to Mayo Clinic, swelling in the prostate can cause these things. Pain and burning while urinating, difficulty urinating, dribbling, hesitant urination, frequent urination, you're up at night, urgent need to urinate, cloudy urine, blood in the urine, a pain in the abdomen, groin, or lower back, pain in the area between the scrotum and, and, te and rectum, pain or uh, discomfort in the penis or testes, painful ejaculation, and flu signs and symptoms of bacterial prostatitis. Wow. I would hate to have this problem. Um, it, so, prostate problems, how does a man know, right? Generally, a man with symptoms, any of those, will visit a urologist who will take a history and do a digital rectal exam and a PSA. According to the website Urology Web, despite a standard FDA approval resting primarily on whether a device is safe and uh, effective, the highly ineffective PSA and its 97% false positive rate was given FDA approval in 1994. I'm falling out of my chair. What have we learned? The mammogram is 58% effective. This is almost 20% effective, and all men are lining up, and doctors are happy to do this test. Folks, really, we need to think about this. How do I keep my prostate? How do I keep the breast tissue? How do I stay healthy? You've been watching Know the Cause for quite a while. How does a man know? This means that over three of four men who had a PSA test got the wrong results. The test results were positive when they should have been negative. Couple this with the false negative rate of the PSA test, and the test is highly unreliable. Unbelievable. Reliable PSA test, WebMD says this back a few years ago, the PSA blood test is commonly used to check for signs of prostate cancer or other prostate problems. When a PSA level comes back high, the next step is often a biopsy. But a new study, I love this, suggests another course of action, another PSA test done more than a month down the line. That's because a PSA level can fluctuate up and down, so a man with a high PSA level may not actually have any prostate problems at all. Thank you. In fact, after studying nearly a thousand men, researchers found that about half of those with PSA levels, uh, with PSA levels were initially high, had a normal result in a subsequent test. Thank you. Why? Why did this take? 50 years to learn who's working in our best interest, how big medicine hijacked the PSA test and caused a public health disaster. 
Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> Doctors are always looking for bacterial prostate infections, but rarely for fungus. And yet principles and practice of clinical mycology said 25 years ago, yeast species are the most common fungi that infect the urinary tract, and hence the commonest cause of fungal prostatitis. Guys, yeast, are we passing this back and forth? Okay. Fungal prostatitis, the role of fungal infections as a causative factor for prostatitis is currently underestimated, says the European Journal of, uh, Journal of Urology, Journal, Journal of Urology. And finally, this, might the PSA test be a fungal test? My good friend Dr. Costantini published this. Structurally, the PSA molecule is a 33 kilodalton serine protease, that's a big way of saying an enzyme, which was found to be produced by five fungi, all of which are sac fungi. The doctor does a digital rectal exam, and he feels, you know, like on your knuckle right here, a little sac, but on this muscle right here, it feels normal. That's what a normal PSA or a normal prostate exam feels like. Doctor feels a lump. These are sac fungi that can grow in a nodule, in a lump. What's going on here? All I'm saying is please, please be careful. Hey, welcome back, friends. Thank you for joining us right now. I say us because my good buddy, Dr. Ross Pelton, is here. Dr. Pelton is a pharmacist. He has a PhD degree. He's a certified clinical nutritionist. <laughs> nutritionist. Uh, he has a blog that's been very, very successful. And if anybody understands this and how it works with this, it is Dr. Pelton. Thanks for coming in today. Nice to be with you, Doug. Our education. Uh, GERD, indigestion, heartburn. Uh, we tend to think, and I think erroneously, Dr. Pelton, that it's because of too much acid in our body. So teach us. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> <Right? laughs> yeah. People feel like their guts are on fire. And most people think it's they have too much acid, and so they take antacids, and they take these proton pump inhibitors and the other prescription drugs that are suppressing acid. But oftentimes, the problem is too little acid, not too much acid. When you have too little acid, it creates inflammation in the lining of the stomach, and it feels like heartburn, because inflammation is like it's painful. But the problem is too little acid, not too much acid. Okay, where do probiotics come into that? Because well, we're not swallowing acid, right? No, but probiotics keep the right balance between good bacteria and bad bacteria, and when you have a predominance of the good bacteria, they're actually producing what we call postbiotic metabolites. They, they produce compounds that are fulvic acids and nucleic acids and organic acids and short-chain fatty acids, and these weakly acidic compounds create the optimal acid base balance, which is slightly acidic for a healthy digestive tract. But when people take these antacids and suppress acid secretion, you actually promote the growth of your bad bacteria and get this condition called dysbiosis, which is gas, pain, bloating, inflammation. So, and this slide here is telling people and showing people that as we age, there is a decline in the production of stomach acid. And this creates this problem of inflammation and people then erroneously think that they've got too much acid, so they take more of the antacids and increasingly suppress acid secretion, which allows the growth of bad bacteria and creates these gastrointestinal problems that are the most common cause of doctor visits. So people really, really need to learn that it's the probiotics and a healthy diet that are the way to <clears throat> create a healthy digestive system. Don't treat this, oh, I got a burning in my gut. Don't treat that with antacids. Drink lots of water, drink, eat healthy foods, take your probiotics to reestablish a healthy microbiome and this good, bad bacteria. We all have some bad bacteria, but it's when they get out of balance that you have problems. You know, I've got to ask you while we're on TV here, I've wanted to ask you this for years and years, and I probably should have asked you at an airport or <laughs> somewhere where we're lecturing together. You're one of the authorities on probiotics in this country. Yeah. Congratulations Thank on you. that. I know long before yeah. probiotics made the market, you were preaching this, yep. and you were absolutely right. The loyalty to Dr. O'Hara's probiotics has been unprecedented. And I know because you're outspoken, you publish, you're a very knowledgeable man, you've had probiotic companies want you to work with yeah. them. 
this loyalty, I've seen it with everybody that works with Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. You look at my shelf at home, Dr. O'Hara's yeah. probiotics. Why Dr. O'Hara's? How is it different? Because this audience walks into a health food store and sees 12 different yeah. probiotics. Dr. O'Hara's is different than every other probiotic in the world because of the way it's made. We have a fermentation production process where 12 strains of bacteria are used to start the process, and then they add dozens of different types of organically grown food to these large fermentation vats in a sterile warehouse. The bacteria get to digest the food and start creating these postbiotic metabolites for a period of three years. So when we encapsulate Dr. O'Hara's, you don't just have probiotics. You've got probiotics, some of the prebiotic foods, but most importantly, master delivery system for postbiotic metabolites. And these are the compounds that have anti-inflammatory activity, they kill the bad bacteria, they reestablish your acid-base balance. It's the postbiotic metabolites that really control your gut health and the health of your whole body. This is a living bacteria. That's the one. The others, folks, you will find them in the dairy, you know, the, the refrigerated section, et cetera. Um, we all have choices. This is one of the leading authorities here in America on probiotics, and he chooses Dr. O'Hara's. It's a lie. It's easy to take. It's easy to keep the postbiotic effect, the good health, ensues when you swallow this every day. Thank you, Dr. Pelt, for having me. Great day. Okay, Vicki asks a Facebook question. By the way, that set right back there is where I do Facebook a couple times a week. I do an hour, hour and a half and answer your questions. Vicki asks, hello, what prescribed antifungals can I take? Again, a choice between you and your doctor, right? Uh, antifungals, after taken for a short period of time, assist a physician in knowing if your health problems, be they breathing, brain, skin, etc., are linked to fungus. Starve it with a Kaufman 1 diet. Ask your doctor for Diflucan, which is a bloodstream antifungal, and Nystatin, which is a tummy antifungal, for a few weeks or a month. With the diet and with the antifungals, you're going to know. There are many new antifungals coming out, but remember, there are that many antibiotics that doctors learn about in medical training and that many antifungals, leaving doctors to believe everything's bacteria, almost nothing's fungus. Share your thoughts openly with your doctor and try antifungals if he or she will let you. So friends, we have an endocrine system. And when it's out of sync, these are hormone producing glands, endocrine glands. When it's out of sync, we go see an endocrinologist. If only they knew about mold, mildew, and what we call endocrine disruptors. Dr. Margaret Christensen, is, is, she's everything. Integrative medicine, OBGYN, uh, uh, certified in those areas. Thank you for coming Thanks on the so show. Thanks so much, Doug. Yeah, hormones. Have... Hormones are us. I love to talk about hormones. <laughs> hormones are us. Great name for a business. Uh, but it's a huge problem in that everybody today, hey, Doug, everybody. what do I do about Fungi grow in any human tissue except the teeth. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so you can take totally. it Totally. Well, you know, and again kind of what's what's interesting so the part of our brain that's called the hypothalamus that's connected to our pituitary tan gland that's the master regulator of everything that's going on so unfortunately we have so many chemicals in our environment uh, all the pesticides all the stuff that's in personal hair uh, personal care products cleaning products and things that we use plus if we are breathing in dirty air that's full of pollutants including toxic mold and then we get sick we take antibiotics they also have hormone disrupting properties so a lot of uh, people don't realize that in your gastrointestinal tract actually is where a lot of your hormones are metabolized so it, Doug if these bacteria in here if your probiotics are not healthy they've all died off you got yeast growing then um, you are going to disrupt your hormonal metabolism PMS, PCOS, infertility, heavy periods, uh, premature menopause, I see that all the time, severe hot flashes and sweats, those are all uh, underlying, uh, underlying all of those can be fungal overgrowth. You know, I one time read an article that said BPAs, you know, plastics yes. in, mm -hmm. were estrogenic, you know, were hormone uh, uh, mimickers. Or I guess they said they're hormone disruptors, not mimickers. Mm -hmm. And then along comes this xeranol or xerelinone made by fusarium mold that tends to be slightly, FDA said in 1993, it's okay, but other countries won't import our meat. 
uh, because they're concerned about this xeranol that's been added to fatten calves quickly. You know? Absolutely. And so we're exposed to endocrine disruptors all the time, whereas when I was a kid, what's an endocrine disruptor? You know? Totally. And yeah, and well, you know, we had been talking about antibiotics previously, and antibiotics are used to fatten cows and chickens to, to bring them to market. So can you imagine, you know, I have all these ladies coming to me all the time, I can't lose weight, I can't lose weight, and I start getting their antibiotic history, as well as their exposure to toxic mold. Those two things can really signal the body to store fat, store fat, store fat, store fat. Antibiotics are mycotoxins, you know, we know that. You know, kind of interesting you mention that because these women will mm -hmm. go, or men, obese, mm -hmm. will go to a doctor and they'll say, yeah, you've got a chemical imbalance. Mm -hmm. What's a chemical? Well, it's an endocrine imbalance. Well, what causes that? And did you learn this in your all your medical training? You never. No. Did you hear the word? No, mycotoxin? no. We learned it, the drug, the drug it out, cut it out method. So you know, yeah. you give it. You know, and I was in charge of nipples to knees as a um, as a gynecologist, <laughs> and so anything outside of that realm, I sent off to a, a different specialist. Right. But if I was going to, you know, treat somebody, it's like what hormonal pill, birth control pill, or do I need to do a surgery on them, a hysterectomy or whatever, uh, and. I can just tell you, I mean, I've been doing this now for uh, 20 years almost, doing it from an integrative standpoint, how much better it works. When you clean somebody's diet up, when you get rid of all the toxins in your food supply um, and all the pesticides, get rid of all those damn plugins in your house. Oh my God, they're horrible for you and they're full of endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. All the chemicals uh, you wash your clothes with, everything, try natural, um, you know, organic foods and natural cleaning stuff and natural makeup. Clean up your diet, right? Go on a vacation, leave mm -hmm. your home for a week yeah. or two during Christmas time, yeah. and see if when you go away you don't feel much better. Mm -hmm. Could it be your home? It could. That's it. Yeah. As well too. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot, Doug. All right. Yeah. Bye. You know, especially in 2020, I took extra vitamin D. Uh, why? Because I read an article that uh, people who succumb to this COVID infection were deficient mostly to vitamin D, okay, it helps the immune system. So I wanted to do a little five minute story here on vitamin D and make sure you're not taking too much. How would you know? Micro calcifications on mammograms, calcified, you know, the doctor says, wow, I don't know what that is. It looks like your hip is growing extra calcium. Why is that? Could it be vitamin D? Let's study this. Here it is. Good old vitamin D. Cholecalciferol is vitamin D3. We all know that vitamin D has many positive effects on our health, of course. A recent study from the University of Chicago Medicine states that in our quest to ward off illness, we might be taking too much vitamin D. Taking far too much of this supplement, which can lead to health risks, that are as dangerous as those associated with getting too little of the vitamin. So taking too much might end you up in troubles, right? Cardiovascular troubles, vascular uh, troubles. Uh, and I'll show you why. The next graphic says it. For 15 years, from 1999 to 2014, and this comes out of the Journal of the American Medical Association, Researchers found a 2.8% increase in the number of people taking potentially unsafe amounts of vitamin D. I want to stall here for a second. 3% of 300 million people, that's a lot of people, not taking vitamin D supplements, taking too much vitamin D. And one way we have knowing, this is a fat-soluble nutrient, we aren't going to urinate it out, right? One way we know is calcification begins. You know, has your doctor said, well, your mammogram showed microcalcifications, or I looked at your x-rays and your hip seems to be growing extra calcium, or your toes. What's going on here? Where is this stuff coming from? <clears throat> so the daily recommended dose for vitamin D is about six to 800 international units. The same survey identified the upper limits of vitamin D consumption to be about 4,000 IUs a day. Anything more was deemed unsafe. Many of you guys tell me, you know, during my live uh, Facebook conversations, many of you tell me, I'm taking 10,000 IU a day. Be careful, be careful, and go to a doc. At Life Extension, you can go to any lab out there in your town, get blood drawn through Life Extension, and they can report back to you what your vitamin D levels are. Daily intake beyond 4,000 IU increases the risk for hypercalcemia a condition characterized by too much calcium in the blood. It can weaken bones, create kidney stones, and interfere with heart and brain function. How many of you have told me, Doug, I got kidney stones? Where'd that come from? Could it, could it come from you getting too much vitamin D supplementally? How do I know? 
The Kaufman diets are rich in salmon, swordfish, tuna, sardines, egg yolks, all high in vitamin D. And then, of course, cod liver oil supplements are also high in vitamin D. I exercise in the sun during the summer months, uh, maybe four days, five days a week, maybe 20 to 30 minutes. Human skin absorbs vitamin D from the sun. I then supplement with vitamin D, more so in the winter months, when my exercise continues, but the sunshine is limited. Do you understand that? If you're taking cod liver oil supplements, eating a lot of eggs, you know, a couple eggs a day with the yolks in, and you love salmon and tuna and swordfish and things like that, and it's sunny out, and you're out in it 10 to 30, 40 minutes a day, maybe you don't need to supplement. So what do you do? How do you know? My last graphic, I think, uh, uh, says it all. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, so be careful and be certain. Ask your doctor for a vitamin panel blood test. Again, Life Extension, my clients can do that for you, including vitamin D. So you'll get vitamin B, vitamin A, and all those tests, but I also want vitamin D. Then you'll know where your vitamin D levels are and others of the vitamins are. Now, the NSC Gold, Frank Jordan, my friend, NSC Gold Daily Multivitamin has 400 IU of vitamin D in it. That's kind of the minimum dose, right? And Life Extension's two-a-day multivitamin has 2,000 IU vitamin D. Again, folks, it all depends <clears throat> on how much time you're out in the sun. It depends on how much vitamin D is in your diet. It depends on many things. Do we need to supplement? Here's what we learned from COVID. Germs seem to leave us alone when our vitamin D2, D3 levels are up. How do we know? Time in the sun, get a blood test. If you have any questions, go to a doctor, get a blood test, go to Life Extension, ask for a vitamin blood panel. Then you'll know with certainty. I hope that helps because so many of us right now, out of concern, are just throwing down 10,000 IU vitamin D a day. Be careful. I took Dr. O'Hara's probiotics this morning. Thank you, Ross Pelton, for coming in, Dr. Ross Pelton. There's the one I took. This company also makes Reg Active, which produces glutathione, very important for the liver and, and all organs of your body. So call them and uh, get acquainted with their probiotics. Isn't it interesting the way I dovetailed antifungal prescriptions and prostate PSA? Folks, far be it for me to ever tell you not to have a PSA test or antibiotics. Just talk to your doctor, even the Center for disease control says talk to your doctor about fungus before you take an antibiotic sometimes they're necessary thank you dr christensen most importantly thank you and thank god we'll see you next time